Okay, we're live. Uh, hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is Wisdom Wednesdays, and we're continuing our study of the book of Proverbs. If you have not seen the previous episodes on Proverbs, they're already uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So I hope you go back and watch those. Right now, we're on Proverbs chapter 13. And we're going to pick it up in verse 13. But first, let me ask uh, Brother Eric to say hi to everybody. Hello, everybody. I uh, pray that all is well with everyone. And uh, as usual. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Uh Okay, so, so which one of us is the ranger and which one of us is Tonto? Well, uh, we often uh, switch back and forth uh, as, as we please. So uh, whichever one you want is fine. Yeah. Tonto, Tonto was a very admirable character, too. So either way is okay. Um, bro, we tried starting this show earlier, uh, and uh, the, there was some computer malfunction and my computer shut down by itself and restarted. So uh, if you're wondering what happened, uh, uh, it's a totally new um, new uh, link for the show. So Brother Bill is trying to get back on, I assume, now. We lost him. Hopefully he'll be joining us again as soon as he can work out these many technical problems. But for now, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we're going to go with uh, Proverbs chapter 13, verse... Um, 13 and first we're going to look at this in the uh, KJV because I'm a KJV firstist Not a KJV onlyist, but I will look at the KJV first and then sometimes I find it helpful to look at uh, The amplified translation or some other but it says in verse 13 Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed But he that feareth the, the commandment shall be rewarded Wow. Pretty strong language both ways, huh? Definitely. This, okay. When it says despises the word shall be destroyed, what do you how do you take the word in that in that case? It would definitely have to be the word of God. Uh-huh. Well, we know that uh, the Word of God is uh, twofold. We have the Scriptures that is identified as the Word of God, and we have Jesus Christ who is also identified as the Word of God. So uh, I, I think in this case it might be talking about uh, the Scriptures. Because well, you've in, already uh, approved uh, my doctrine of the two are one, and the two uh, we believe that the two are one. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Yes. So um, the the scriptures. If 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 you're watching now and, and, and you do not love the scriptures, particularly the main theme of the Bible, and that is that um, God wants us all to go to heaven, and and He offers a free um, free gift of salvation and eternal life in heaven to everyone. The only thing that's required of us is that we put our faith completely in Jesus as our Savior. This is the main theme of the Bible, and so this is the Word of God. Jesus is also called in, in uh, uh, the first chapter of, of uh, I mean, this, uh, John 1, 1, 2, and 3. It refers to Jesus as the Word. So put your, you must not despise the Scriptures, particularly the main theme of the Scriptures and the main church of the Scriptures, which is Jesus Christ. If you do, you will be destroyed. There is no hope for you. And then, uh, before I go on to the second part, brother, what else do you want to add to that? Oh, brother Bill's back, huh? Yeah, I finally got in. I've been trying to get in. Yeah, what? brother. My computer just uh, a notification came up, and it says it's going to shut down. And and you know, it did a countdown, and it said it'll restart. So that's what happened, and hopefully. We're good to go now, so we're live. 
Okay, brother, let me ask you to comment on on the first part, the first half of uh, Proverbs 13, verse 13, the first, first half of that verse. Uh, I don't know if you heard what I just said, but go ahead and please comment on it. Hang on, just let me get me, get me by the little hand. I've literally, like I said, just, just got in. So, Proverbs 13, 13. Yeah, just the first half. <clears throat> just the first half. So, whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed. Yeah, well, to me, a lot of stuff, I've only just come in, but just looking at that, you can take that two ways. One, despise of Christ, who is the living word, so you are certainly going to be <laughs> destroyed if you don't accept him as saviour, and obviously to despise the, the, the written word, because the written word, you know, speaks abundantly clear about Christ all the way through. So, yeah, double whammy there. You've got to love the written word and the living word. That's what I'd say. Well, Gee, brother, are you sure you didn't hear what I said? You said exactly the same thing. That's a result in it. No, nope, didn't hear a thing. I just come in. And then uh, just... I'm, glad, uh, I'm, I'm happy when people uh, confirm what I say. I'm also happy when they disagree because I like I can learn a different perspective too. But uh, brother Eric is my witness. I said basically what you just said. Okay. And, uh, so brother Eric. Uh, what do you think? Bill, Brother Bill and I are in agreement on that. It's always a great pleasure when uh, my lawyers are in agreement. <laughs> yeah. All right. in agreement. Okay, so, uh, yeah, the, the first thing a person needs to understand is that the scriptures, uh, this is, people call it the Holy, the Holy Bible, uh, but this is also called the Word of God. And uh, all of it is profitable for our learning, but there is one main character and one main theme in this book that is absolutely essential. And that is that the Word of God is not only this written Word, but it's this person, Jesus Christ, God who became flesh and died for our sins. And so uh, when we hear the word, the term Word or Word of God, it does have this twofold meaning. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think that uh, it's, we're in absolute agreement that if you do not, uh, it says if you despise Jesus, the uh, incarnate Word of God, or if you describe the written Word that talks about Jesus and, and everyone's need for him, then you, you will have destruction. Anything else you want to say before we go to part two of that verse? Not, yes, not, uh, I would can. like to say, huh? Oh. Go ahead. No, no, over to you, over to you. Uh, yes, I just wanted to men, uh, point out that Jesus said uh, his words are his flesh. All right. His words are his flesh. I don't remember that verse. I, I'm not questioning whether it's in there. Usually when somebody tells me something, I'm, I'm familiar with it. I mean, I may not know the address of the verse or the exact quotation for the verse, but I, I'm familiar with the, the, the verse in some way. Uh, do you know where it says that exactly? Or, or oh, Let me go and find it. Yeah, okay. I'd like to see that. But uh, let me look at this first half of this verse now. We looked at it in the KJV. Let's look at it in the Amplified. And uh, I want to see if it, it can... Uh, uh, how, how it phrases it. And it says, uh, whoever despises the word and counsel of God brings destruction upon himself. Uh, okay, so um, I, I think that this interpretation is um, a little different in, in the sense that it's talking about the instructions and how to live our lives. Uh, more like uh, uh, the law and the prophets, uh, rather than focusing on this person, Jesus, in salvation. Uh, I think well, this interpretation would also be true in this case, but uh, as, uh, as we've all said, there is a, another meaning to this that is even more important than this, even though maybe in context, uh, this amplified uh, version uh, really focuses on 
the context of what it's talking about. Listening to the instructions that we find in the Bible, if we follow the instructions, uh, our lives are going to be better. If we don't, you know, we'll, we'll have uh, destroyed lives, like uh, like a person who has uh, you know, destructive, uh, you know, bad habits, and they destroy their lives in that way. Um, okay, uh, we'll go on to the second part. But first, let me get your comments on what's your reaction to the amplified uh, explanation of it. Well, I prefer the King James version for that. For that. Yes. <laughs> I think the King James has rendered it a bit more accurate. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now let's go to the, the second half of that verse. Uh, uh, I'm bouncing back on this Bible Gateway thing. I should have just. I had it all copied before. I posted it in the in the chat bar. I'm what you are looking at next? You, know, you, you got the link. Okay. Uh, I'll just keep this one on the on the. Amplify that, and we'll use your post there for the uh, uh, King James. No, I'm not amplified here. Sorry. Sorry, this is. I had this all set up before we started the lecture. Try to start the first time. Okay. Okay. So the second half of it is. Uh, but he that feareth the commandments shall be rewarded. Feareth the commandments. How do you, how do you take that fearing the commandments? <coughs> well, yeah, yeah. I, I assume. Well, I said not reading the, the previous passages. That you know, that it's having a reverence for this commandment. You know, whatever the commandment in the context is. You know, it, it could be speaking on obviously you despise the word shall be destroyed, and it could be speaking, you know, to fear that which has just been said, you know, have reverence for that. Well, we know that the word fear is used an awful lot in the book of Proverbs. Uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding is an important uh, verse. And um, we talked about that quite a bit earlier in the previous uh, discussion. That fear is not a, that a person could say it absolutely means fear because you're, you fear the results. As we were discussing earlier before we started the show, what happens to someone if they do not follow? These uh, commandments, uh, particularly this royal law of love we were discussing, uh, well, we know that a person is not going to go to hell if they're saved um, simply because they fail to love everybody. Uh, but if they don't love everybody, they, they in, in, instead um, um, treat people badly and disrespectfully and so on, then there's going to be the law of reaping and sowing that applies to them. They're, you, you, if you are sowing bad things like hatred, dishonesty, you know, uh, jealousy, envy, gossip, those kinds of things that which are not love, if you sow those things, then what you're going to reap back is destruction. You're going to reap back bad things. Um, and it's the same thing we also know about the, another law that the, the Hebrews talks about, the chastisement of the Lord. Um, if you're if you're a child of God, then then God will correct His children and, and, and kind of give us some people say it's like getting a spanking or, or being sent into the, uh, a timeout or something. How you how you would punish the children um, uh, if they got in the line? If you don't, if you fail to do that, then you're not really a loving parent according to the scriptures. So we know that there. If someone does not follow the instructions, now we can call them commandments, uh, but as we said earlier, the commandments that were given to Israel uh, in the Mosaic Laws were never really given to the Gentile world at all before Christianity or even since Christianity. They never really applied to us uh, as a religion to follow. But 
it is wise to do the things like don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't be jealous, and so on. These it is wise to 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 uh, fear those things. If you you fear that if, if you do the wrong things, even if it's not out of love, you should understand that you're you're going to be punished in some way, either by the judicial legal system in your country <laughs> because you're breaking laws or by the chastisement of God, or by a jealous husband that wants to kill you because you had adultery with his wife. So that's what I think when it says fear. Uh, Bill said it was respect or reverence. But I, I think fear, either way, either word can really apply. Yeah, it does make a little bit of more sense when you get to verse 14. So it clarifies it a little bit for us. Uh, will, you, will you read verse 14 for us? Yep, yep. And it says, The law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. So we could, we could within the, you know, constraints of just a few verses we've got at the moment, you know, to, to fear the commandment, you know, those who fear the commandment should be rewarded, could be talking about the law of the wise, wisdom, in that sense, because it's the fountain of life, like, like you just categorised earlier. Yeah, the Gentiles were never under the law, but it's certainly wise and correct, to, to, to and especially if we want to be blessed, to, to, to keep some of the law in that sense, especially the, the Ten Commandments, you know, so that that's that's wisdom, that's the law applied through wisdom, not through we have to obey the law in regard to salvation or anything else or the laws imposed on us, you know, as Gentiles, but rather because it is wise to, to, to you know, adhere to that because it is a fountain of life, you know, it will make our life easier here on earth. You know, as you just explained, you know, if you if you committed adultery, you, you've caused harm, uh, and you're going to have a consequence of that. You're going to certainly fear the, the you know the person coming after you, wanting to beat you around the head because you've just slept with his wife or vice versa. So yeah, there's there's wisdom in keeping the the, the moral laws for sure. Um, while we're discussing the laws and and the commandments written on stone, um, uh, some people may not be aware that uh, the Mosaic Law is much broader than the Ten Commandments that most people are familiar with. There were 613 laws written down, uh, only 10 of them were written on stone, and uh, uh, all those laws applied to everything. It was, it was almost like uh, a, a set of laws that you have in a city, in the city ordinances. That, you know, people are expected to follow, and otherwise, you know, you break a law that the police will get you and you're punished somehow. So they had a whole legal system and it's called their 613 law. Why is it you think that these particular 10 were put on stone apart from all the others? I think it's because they're hard as stones and they were written for people who had hard hearts. Yeah, because if I, and Brother Eric likes to bring it up often, if they would have only obeyed the royal law of love and their hearts were like flesh, that then, then 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 the stony laws need to be made. But because they was a stiff necked people, hard at heart, they needed rock hard stony commandments and laws, you know, to, to go with them. You know, hard heart does a you know reaps you know a hard law. Uh, we were we were talking before we went live about uh, some people in the church today who are, are picking a, a few of these mosaic laws and trying to apply them to the church, even though even though they teach that we're not under the law but we're under grace. They they teach that there are a couple of mosaic laws that still apply. Like, for example, the person we were talking about that says that uh, it, it says that homosexuals should be the, the punishment is capital punishment, death, a death sentence for homosexuality. 
Um, and they, out of all 613 laws, they pick that one and say that one still applies today. Uh, and, uh, and yet, we know, number one, those laws were only given to Israel. They were not given to the Gentiles before the cross and even after the cross. Now that we have Christianity, they're not intended for us. And yet, there are some people that want to pick out, uh, like the, the Seventh Day Adventists, they, they pick out their, their favorite, the, you know, the Sabbath. Uh, we're worshiping on Saturday instead of Sunday. Uh, and then some people have pick out that one law that says we should execute a homosexual. Uh, but none of those laws are supposed to be applied to us, are they? Well, no. no. And, and, and you might the point right. They, they seem to pick and choose. There's 613 there, and they decide to pick and choose ones that that, that they like, you know, or, or, or goes with, it, with their, their mindset. You know, but very rarely do you see, you know, uh, ministers or pastors or legalists condemn people for wearing poly cotton. Yet it says that you're not to wear two types of material. It tells you not to eat shellfish and pork. You know, it, it's an all or nothing deal with the law. You know, you're either completely under the law or you're not under the law. You know, and that's how it is. And, and, and even James makes a point. You know, if you break one of these commandments, you've broken them all by default, which shows you're either under all of them or none of them. And but thanks be to God, you know, we're as Gentiles and under, under you know, certainly this church age, the only law we're under is the royal law of love. That's to love God and love the brethren. It's as simple as that, isn't it? And and if you're a wretch like me, you're a human being like ninety nine point nine 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 percent of this whole world, and you're not a robot, then then you should be thankful and grateful that, that Christ has has done this for us. That we can choose just to love instead of hate. Yeah. So uh, that's one thing that I, I've talked about quite a bit in previous videos is that this this is a very big misunderstanding that the church has today. I would say a vast majority of the church somehow thinks that the Mosaic laws apply to the church in some way. Even if they don't think they apply in terms of salvation, they think we still are under it and, and, and these are things that we must do. But uh, uh, the, the law, if, if, if what we're on the subject of homosexuality, it would be wise if a homosexual didn't practice it. Because um, just anatomically, the bodies are not designed for that kind of uh, uh, intercourse. And, and so when you, when you misuse the body in that way, then you have health problems. Uh, and and uh, various diseases. So, um, even though that law doesn't really apply to, to, to the church, none of the laws really do, it would be wise for a homosexual to, to not practice homosexuality. And yet, uh, if they do, um, it doesn't mean that uh, they not can't be a Christian or that they lose their salvation or something. It, it just means that they're doing something that's very unwise. The Bible says that, no, this is not how you, you are made. And if, we, and if you want to behave in that way, there will be consequences. And we know of some of the health consequences that, that come from that. Well, yeah, yeah. I was, I was just going to bring up, uh, you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, you know, and that's where Paul says, you know, all things are lawful for me. But all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things, you know, edify not. And I suppose that that is a good way to sum things up. And how you've just expressed it, you know. Yet we're not under the law. You know, we're not obliged to keep the law and to, to be saved or stay saved. But for sure, they're beneficial. As you made the point, biologically, it's beneficial to to stay within. A, a, a husband and wife, man and woman relationship. If you don't, then it's going to cause problems, isn't it? If you have extra amount of affairs, there's chances of obviously certainly repercussions from from the other person's partner. So you know that. So yeah, in one sense, you're not under law, and you can freely choose to to do what is wrong there. But there's consequences. It's not expedient for you. 
you know, you'll end up getting a disease, you'll end up getting beaten up by the, the other person's partner, and, and obviously you're grieving God at the same time. So there's no, you know, nothing's expedient in that at all, is there? All right, I'm going to look at verse 14 in the Amplified and see how that phrases it. The teaching of the wise is the fountain of life, that one may avoid the snares of death. So this kind of really sums up very succinctly uh, the point we're making. It's wise. You'll have a better, healthier, more prosperous, uh, happier life if you uh, live according to what the scripture tell us. It's some people call this an instruction manual for our lives. It's like you know when you buy a car or, or a new TV or something, you, you get an instruction manual with this, and, and uh, you you need to read it and learn the proper way of, of uh, following those instructions. In the Bible, it tells us instructions and the best way to live our lives. And it's saying here, we'll be wise, it'll be a fountain of life. But if you don't live according to it, then there's the snares of death. And one, one snare of death example would be um, sexual diseases. So, um, all right, Brother Eric, you've been kind of quiet. Anything you want to say before we move on to verse 15? Uh, actually, I'll just point out one thing here uh, in verse 14. The law of the wise, uh, the fulfillment of that is the gospel of Jesus Christ is now the law of the wise. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really the only law that really applies uh, to the world. And, and, that, and, and, and that is that uh, you must believe on Jesus Christ to, to be saved. And... That's what Jesus, when he says, um, my yoke is easy. To be yoked to Jesus, to be joined to Jesus through the Holy Spirit and your spirit being united and your spirit being regenerate, for that to happen, that yoking, all you've got to do is believe on Jesus and trust him completely. Uh, then he goes on saying, my burden is light. I think he's talking about how he, you know, he said, uh, I'll, I'll convince all the laws that are just one thing. We just love each other. And uh, in, in the book of James, he called it the royal law. But So really all, the, all that we're uh, told we must do is believe on Jesus. And then what we really should do would be, would be wise, condense the laws and to love each other. Now, if you love me, you're not going to lie to me, are you? If you love me, you're not going to steal. You're not going to want to hurt me in any way. If you love me, you're going to want to do kindness and, and uh, do loving things rather than uh, you know bad things. So that's why Jesus and, and, and also in James is, is condensed down to that one thing. We'll go on, but first let me ask you to say anything before we move to verse 15. No, no, I'm fine. Okay, verse 15, KJV says, Good understanding gives a favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. Uh, and I, that's really saying the same thing, I think. I don't know if we need to expound on that. But verse 16 says, Every prudent man dealeth with knowledge, but a fool layeth open his folly. Uh, these all these verses are really just it's a, they could be like one flowing statement and uh, when it says prudent a prudent person is, is a wise person but that's what wisdom in action you, you you wise and you act act it out that's being prudent uh, so every prudent man so if you're wise enough to uh, listen to the scriptures live your life according to the way the scriptures tells us to live it uh, and then uh, you're you're going to be blessed. It's, there's always a contrast in all these verses and proverbs. You know, if you're wise, you're going to get good, good results. If you're foolish, you're going to get bad results. Uh, but a fool layeth open his folly. You guys want to say anything on these verses before we go to seventeen? 
Yeah. Right, nice common sense. Yeah, common sense. Do you remember that, that verse uh, in um, uh, Luke uh, 101, verse 192? It says, common sense is very uncommon. Yeah, I remember that one. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the sad things about about the world as a whole. Is that um, we we do these wisdom Wednesday, we, um, just studying the Book of Proverbs because it's all about being, gaining wisdom, and and by being wise and living our life in a wise fashion, uh, we we end up having a much better life. Uh, and, and yet, uh, the, this I, the common sense, uh, unfortunately, the, the, this is all based on common sense, but it's not very common to have common sense. I, I, to me, it's, a, it's like an oxymoron, common sense. It doesn't have, I don't see it in, in play very much in the world today. You think common sense is really common, or is it uncommon? Certainly, uncommon sense, and so and so is reason as well. I found that you know out over the last few years that that reason has gone out the window. It really is. Yeah, uh, reason and also uh, tolerance too. I, I've talked a lot about that as one of my main grievances within the church is people being intolerant on on, uh, on uh, minor doctrines. Well, let's go to verse uh, 17. A wicked messenger falleth into mischief, but a faithful ambassador is health. Hmm. I have some ideas on that, but let me hear what you have to say. Was that was that Eric you were just asked? No, that was just anybody. Anybody who wants to say. Oh, your sound, your sound is terrible, man. So I didn't even pick up on, on what what you said at all. Uh, okay, uh, I just read verse seventeen, and uh, uh, before I comment, I want to give you either one of you a chance to comment on verse seventeen. Okay, right. So, something a wicked mess you're full of into mischief. But faithful and bass, yeah, and bass, that is health. Yeah, so yeah, that's generally the way, you know, you kind of reap what you sow there, isn't it? If you're a wicked messenger, you, you will fall into your own mischief in the end. You know, Jesus even described that, didn't he, when talking about the, the Pharisees, you know, digging a pit, they fall into it themselves, don't they? And that, and that you know, and that, that, that is reaping and sow, sowing right there. But a faithful ambassador is health. That's obviously true as well. You know, but if you're faithful to, to, to God's wisdom and God's plan, you know, proper and good, wholesome plan for your life, that certainly is health for you and health for your family. Yeah. Common sense there. Common or uncommon sense there. Well, uh, for those people watching that don't know me or um, Bill and Eric um, very much at this point. Uh, I think it's worth saying that um, we are evangelists. We, our main focus, our part of our ministry, is not just teaching in a broad sense, but um, uh, telling people the good news about Jesus so they get to go to heaven. That's that's to me the most important thing. I mean, what good would it do if we clothed people and fed people and did all these wonderful things and neglected to do the one thing that will allow them to go to heaven? So that's the first most and uttermost thing that we must do is tell people the good news. Uh, and so when I see the words, certain words, it, it kind of like uh, automatically I, I view it from that, uh, that, that mindset. From through that lens, and I see the word here messenger, and I see the word ambassador, and it may not even be an application in context here, but uh, it says a wicked messenger falleth into mischief. I think it's worth saying that uh, 
the word angel uh, is, is tr usually translated as messenger. Now, a lot of people think an angel is always some um, uh, spirit being that God created uh, apart from man, and there's you know good angels or bad angels or fallen angels. But uh, the word angel really means messenger. Uh, God uses these angels to bring a message. Uh, Gabriel gave a message to uh, uh, Mary. Uh, Gabriel's given God several messages uh, in, throughout the scriptures. Uh, but uh, if, if you look at the word evangelist, the root of the word is angel. If you spell it out E V A N G E L, angel. Ist. So it means that it's a person. Ist means someone that is doing is doing something. And what are they doing? They're giving a message. And the prefix Eve means good. So Brother Bill, as an evangelist, uh, you're someone who is bringing a good message, the good news. Um, so Brother Bill, you're an angel. Not in the sense that you're created as an angel, but you're serving as an angel, as a messenger. Uh, you have your message is the gospel. Um, so that's one thing. And then, of course, the other thing is the word ambassador. And I made a video, ambassadors to Christ, really? Because I, I think there's a lot of people that are not really being ambassadors the way that uh, the Lord would want us to. We're, we're representing Jesus and his message. And uh, we have a responsibility to do that, I think, in a, in a right way. So I know that this is not really even the application of the verse in this context, but let me get your reaction to that. I'm going to let Eric have a go, because it's been too quiet. Come on, Eric. Very well. Uh, very well done. Bill and Brother Luke, you are uh, pointing out some very excellent uh, points uh, the last uh, half hour or so, and uh, and yes, absolutely, that verse is a because God knew uh, ahead of time, and that verse does us expressly talk about. Uh, um, uh, ambassadors of Jesus Christ, uh, preachers of the gospel, and it's very important uh, to put your best foot forward when you're uh, carrying the good news to Jesus Christ, because that's all the world gets. Uh, that's all they have is us putting our best foot forward for their sake, and so that's what we're committed to do. Hey, Brother Bill, what do you what do you say about that? The, this word messenger and this word ambassador. Oh well, yeah, yeah, messenger. Yeah, we know this angel, which is a messenger. You know, not that I'm an angel. You know, the boy for tell you I'm not an angel, but it is a messenger, the person who brings glad tidings the gospel. You know, but and a faithful ambassador is health. Well, yeah, we, we are called to be ambassadors of Christ. To, to proclaim this good news, and yeah, so that's that's certainly health for for us that we do that, and it's certainly spiritual health for those who, who hear the good news. You know, that's that's, that's to be honest, that, that's a a situation of heaven or hell, or life and death, really. So yeah, we need to be good ambassadors, get the good news out, and you know, and pray that people are saved. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm, uh, uh, I, I used to associate with someone, uh, a, a street preacher that was very prominent, and he, he and I disagreed on this, on a basic idea. Uh, I, I felt that um, just getting out and doing something in terms of witnessing, preaching, evangelism, just doing something is not enough. Uh, they, they, they must do things in the right way. They must have the right message, and they must deliver it in the right manner. And uh, he, he, he felt that, no, 
as long as they're doing something, even if it's wrong, at least they're doing something. Because he seems to think that there's very few people that are willing to do anything. So those people who are willing to do it, even if they've got that sign that says, God hates fags, he would say, at least you're doing something. But I would say, I'd rather have them do nothing. Because what they're doing is harmful. They're not preaching the true gospel of salvation. They're, they're preaching a false message, uh, works, works of salvation. And they're, and they're also preaching from the wrong spirit. They, they, they're call people names, they're hateful, they're yelling, they're, they're angry, they seem hateful. And that kind of thing is, um, they're not really being ambassadors. I, as, as I understand what an ambassador really is, an African ambassador is a diplomat. A diplomat is someone who is diplomatic, not rude and offensive and just trying to you know, uh, be uh, controversial. Uh, I'll go on to the next verse, but what's your response to that? Yeah, I just agree with it, yeah. Okay, verse uh, 18. Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction, but he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. So, this is something I've said over and over again, but someone that's not familiar with studying the, the, all of Proverbs, um, they, they may not realize that there's all of this contrast. And it's saying that someone that refuses instruction is going to get this bad result, but someone who welcomes instruction it will be honored and have a good result. Uh, so let me ask you to comment on verse 18. Well, it's extolling the virtues of uh, correction. And uh, all the preceding verses were extolling uh, one or another virtue. And every, every verse is going down and extolling different virtues. So this one is extolling the virtues of correction. Again, we've got common sense here again. You know, poverty and shame shall be to him that, you know, refuses instruction. You know, if someone is giving you common sense advice and good wisdom so you can have a life that, you know, that, that you're healthy and you can prosper in, and you refuse that instruction, then you're, you're going to be impoverished. Whether it's a, a physical impoverishment because you're, you're refusing uh, these common sense, you know, words, or whether it's spiritual, you know, poverty because you're you're rejecting spiritual, you know, wisdom. You know, I I agree, but yeah, common sense again. And it goes on, but he that regardeth reproof shall be honoured. So if you if you if you're humble enough to to to, to take excuse of friends, take a holiday, and, and you know you're going to be honoured in that because you, you you've become wise and mature enough to to take a better reproof. So yeah, again, common sense and all good stuff. Why is it you think that uh, some people do refuse instruction? Pride, and that's the biggest killer. I've often said that of all the things that kill on this earth, pride is the one. You know, it was pride that that that, that begat sin in the first place. The pride of Satan, Lucifer. You know, he wanted to ascend into heaven, and be you know. Wanted to be God. He's proud and haughty. So, you know, it, it probably can bring in sin, you know, and, and cause all the trouble we have since that moment, then probably can do a lot of damage. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I agree that uh, pride was uh, the fall, the fall of Satan was based on his pride. And I even think that we can even apply pride to Adam and Eve. Um, well, people have said that the sin they committed was disobeying God and eating this forbidden fruit from the tree, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But I've said that before they ate the fruit, they already sinned because it was the sin of unbelief. They, uh, 
uh, God told them not to eat it or they would die that day, Satan said, no, that's not true. Uh, you will not die that day if you eat it. You'll be like God. And Adam and Eve, instead of believing God, they believed Satan. So they had, they no, did no longer believe God. That's the first sin of unbelief. Uh, but why, why did they want to eat it? I, I think it was like Lucifer wanted to ascend and become his own, own God. And uh, Adam and Eve, they wanted to say, "Well, we can get by without God. We will we'll know good and evil, and then we'll deal with it ourselves." I mean, Instead of just relying on God, they decided that they wanted that knowledge, and that was that they thought they were capable of dealing with it, and they weren't capable. It was their pride that made them think that they they could gain that knowledge and deal with it. Do you think uh, there's any uh, truth in that? Well, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Pride comes before a fall, and, and mankind certainly failed, didn't it? So yeah, there is an element of pride, you know, within that. Because if there was no pride, you know, they'd not even be inclined to to partake, of, you know, of that fruit, the forbidden fruit. It's the fact that, oh wow, we can be gods. We're so special and so great, we can become like gods as well. So yeah, there there is a prideful heart in amongst that disobedience as well. So, uh, um, it, it's wise to listen. I mean, this has been expressed in a lot of different ways in Proverbs that you know you should listen instead of talk so much. You should be uh, accept counsel, uh, accept teaching, and uh, it's wise to to uh, receive instruction. Uh, so, if you don't really want to receive instructions in life, and you have too much pride to think that hey, maybe you think you know more than the other person. Or, uh, I, I've listened to a lot of people in my life that I actually thought I knew more than them. But even if someone doesn't know that much, I've met complete novices in, in Christianity. And yet they say something that's so profound that I've never dawned on me before. Just the first time they, they get a revelation from reading the scriptures, and I, I read the same scriptures 50 times, and, and, and I didn't see that, and they, the very first time, saw it. So you, you can learn if you listen to everybody, even if there's a novice, even if you think you know more than that. It's wise to listen. There's a, there's a quote that I have in my, in my statement. It's not with my statement of faith, but it's, it goes on. Um, um, remember why we debate. Now, debate just means exchange ideas, I think. I express my ideas, you express your ideas, we compare. Now, the, the, remember why we debate. The only thing we have to lose are the errors we hold. Who but a stubborn fool would hold on to errors once they've been exposed? So, what have we got to lose by listening to somebody? Even if you come to the conclusion that their advice is not good, at least listen. <laughs> Even somebody that may, may not know near as much as you, it's wise to at least hear them out and be fair. Okay, let's go to verse uh, uh, 19. The desire accomplishment, the desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, but it is abomination to fools to depart from evil. Well, I need one of you to explain that verse to me. The English confounds me. I'll look at it and amplify, but give me your uh, interpretation of verse 19, please. This verse is extolling the virtues of goal setting.
Yeah, like I said, to, to, to desire accomplished, you know, is sweet to the soul. So, you know, those who want to desire to accomplish, you know, what is good and what is wise, you know, it is sweet to the soul. But, you know, to, to part from evil, which fools do, is an abomination to them. So it's not saying it's an abomination to, <laughs> to, you know, to fools to depart from evil. It's just that how they see it. You know, a wise person, you know, sees his accomplishments as sweet, and, and a foolish person to, to stop being foolish and evil sees it as an abomination to, to cease from, you know, his, his silliness. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, uh, setting goals, as Brother Eric said there. Uh, this is, is telling us that the, the desire, in other words, you have a desire, a goal, something you want to achieve, and then when you accomplish it, it's sweet. You feel very satisfied. And, and, and really, uh, uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing to, to set a goal and achieve it. Uh, I've uh, done a lot of that in my life. I, I even taught a, a class for a while to some people about how to set goals in their lives. Uh, but the second part, but it is an abomination to the fools to depart from evil. Uh, is that talking about it is an abomination that means setting the goals, uh, setting your desires, and working to accomplish it? Is that what is an abomination? No, no, well, no, the, to, to the fool and the evil person, in their eyes, to depart from that evil ways and foolish ways is an abomination to them because they, they, they want to continue in that. So it's not saying, you know, it's, it's the way it's just the English way it's, con, you know, constructed there. It makes sense to me being, you know, old fashioned English. And, but, yeah, I can understand where people can get confused because you can read that. And you could think that it's an abomination for fools to depart from evil, but it's not saying it. It's ha that's how someone who is foolish and who is evil would see themselves if they come away from their folly and their evilness, that it would be an abomination to them. Okay, I'm gonna look, let's look at it in the Amplified and see how they explain it. It says... Uh, Satisfied desire is sweet to a person. Therefore, it is hateful and exceedingly offensive to self-confident fools to give up evil upon which they have set their hearts. Hey, I said, basically says what I said, yeah, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, let's go to verse 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. <laughs> I don't know. That's, some verses, for some reason, they just, they make me laugh. It's, uh, it's, I don't even know why I laugh at something like that, but it seems like... Well, because you've still got common sense. <laughs> so it, it, would, it would make you laugh, you know. If, you, if you're going to hang around with idiots, doing idiotic things, you're going to land up looking like an idiot. So, yeah. <laughs> so, I, I think this verse here is, like, it demonstrates why, why I wanted to associate with you guys. It's, uh, the first part is I, I desire to w walk with wise men. And uh, I don't want to be hanging around with fools. And, unless, you, it's just like, uh, being in the world but not of the world, that kind of a thought too is okay. I don't want to do the sinful, worldly things that uh, we see all around us, and yet I need to be in the world because our light needs to shine for, for them to see the light and for us to witness to them. But uh, uh, so sometimes you, you have to be around a fool for that purpose. But hanging around with fools is it, it, just part of these are the people you like, this is the people you're emulating. That would be really foolish, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, verse 21. Evil pursueth sinners, but to the righteous good shall be repaid. Okay. 
Mm. Yeah, again, that's a classic. Great for the soul there, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Because the evil will follow those who pursue evil. You know, they're eating what the sun. Yet, yet, good shall obviously be paid you know, to, to the righteous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're, they're right. That's another Rico you saw verse there. Uh, verse 22 A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Hmm. Well, the first part's easy to understand. The wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Um, the good people will even inherit the sinner's wealth, I guess it says, huh? Oh, yeah, that's what it seems to be saying there, yeah. So we better, we better be extra good. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. The Amplified, it says, uh, a good man leaves an inheritance of moral stability and goodness. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Uh, I didn't see it any other way except in terms of material wealth there. Here it says, a good man leaves an inheritance of moral stability and goodness to his children's children. And the wealth of the sinner finds its way eventually into the hands of the righteous for whom it was laid up. Hmm. I didn't really identify with that in, initially, that it would be um, the wealth that the good man is giving is uh, wisdom, morality. Do you think that's a little uh, ice of Jesus there? Or do you think it's justified in interpreting it that way? Yeah, that's a hard one, that one. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to say yay or nay to that. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 a hard one. I'm going to have to contemplate, I think. Have some contemplation on that one. Well, uh, you know what? You just demonstrated here. You just demonstrated more wisdom by saying that you wanted to contemplate it. See, that's another thing we learned from Proverbs is to be, uh, you know, don't be so anxious to speak without thinking, you know. If you're not sure, sometimes it's best to say, I don't know, I'm going to think about that. <laughs> Very wise, Brother Bill. <laughs> yeah, I do have my mind, it's not often. <laughs> okay, uh, now verse 23. Much food is in the tillage of the poor, uh, out there is that is destroyed for want of judgment, but there is that is there is that <laughs> is destroyed. Boy, that kind of English is hard for me. But there is that is destroyed for want of judgment. Okay, I need a, an Englishman to explain that to me. I think you're going to have to explain that. I can't even get me head around that one myself. <laughs> Okay, the, the Amplified says, much food is in the tilled land of the poor. Okay, so we know that. Uh, someone who's worked hard will produce it, produce and get uh, results. Uh, but there are those who are destroyed because of injustice. All right. Well... I just, I don't know what to say. Maybe we have Brother Eric has some wisdom on this verse 23. Well, that one ought to be slapping both of you right in the face. Because that's talking about common sense right there. You're, you're muted there, Luke. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Uh, I, I just, uh, to look at it differently based on what Eric said, and it says, uh, there is that is destroyed for want of judgment. Uh, maybe these people, they, if you want something, you lack it. Right? They don't have judgment. They don't have good judgment. Because they don't have good judgment, they're destroyed. They're making bad decisions. Uh, I think it makes sense in that in that way.
All right, let's go to verse 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Hmm. That one's an obvious one. Spare the rod, spoil the child, and all that lot. So, and the same principle. I think you spoke on that earlier. That, that God chastens the ones He loves. You know, but in, spare your rod, don't chasten the ones you love. You don't really love them, do you? Correction is good at times. So yeah, that's that's a, that's an easy one. I'll get that one. <laughs> yeah, we uh, we find it in Proverbs, but we also find the same thing taught in the book of Hebrews that talking about that you know, if you're a father and you do not chase it or um, chase it is a word that just means to discipline them. Uh, how do you discipline them? Well, sometimes you might discipline them with, with um, corporal punishment, maybe a spanking. Sometimes you discipline them with just like taking away privileges, like saying you can't go out on the weekends for a while. Or however it is, when you need discipline your child, then uh, uh, they're, they're, they're going to benefit from that um, as long as you're doing it wisely. Uh, but if you fail to discipline them, you're going to spoil the job, and, and they're going to be turn out to be a horrible person. Uh, I'm just curious uh, how much kind of discipline, either corporal punishment, because it's a spirit of rod. Uh, the rod means corporal punishment, I think. But I think today a lot of people are choosing not corporal punishment. Do you think that it's the same thing can be accomplished without uh, physical punishment, but just say uh, you can't you can't watch TV or you can't use your computer or you, you take away your cell phone for a month or something? Do you think that also can serve the purpose today? And, and if so, how have you chastened your children? I don't know if Eric has children, but go ahead. Well, as for me, I've tried both approaches, and it, it is, like I said, you have to differentiate between, you know, where what the underlying issue is. You know, so, yeah. you know most times, you know, a stern warning or a rebuke or taking away privileges works. But, but sometimes, especially when they're younger, you know, again, you can't reason, you know, with, with, a, with a screaming, spoke five-year-old, sometimes a quick quick slap sorts them out, and that's the job done. Yeah, but, you know, obviously as they get older, they, 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 they can understand reason and understanding, and you don't have to do that. You just, you know, give them a bollock and you tell them off. And if they keep, you know, not listening to uh, your, your, your wisdom or your advice, with good intentions on your heart, you know, part, you know, you have to take away privileges. But yeah, it's both are valid, but both need to be done at the right place in the right time and the right circumstance. So you can't have one rule for everything. You know, every time someone puts a foot wrong in your house, you, you know, you, you, you slap them. You know, it doesn't work like that. Or every time someone puts a wrong in your house, you know, you just talk to them. It doesn't work like that. So it really is individual upon you know the, the situation in it so yeah both are applicable you know sometimes God's chasing me harsher than others you know if, if I'm doing something that is stupid you know sometimes a God will just chasing me with someone pointing out that I'm being stupid I need to grow up and that's enough to to keep me in line you know, hurt me pride that's my, my, my chastening and I'll get over it yet another time you know, if I'm doing something and I'm being quite horrible, perhaps, you know, the Lord will chasten me in that, you know, I'd feel alone for a while. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. So, yeah, God, God chastens us in different ways under different circumstances. Hmm. Um, th thank you. Brother Eric, do you have any children? Yes, I have uh, three grown boys, and uh, I firmly believe in uh, corporal punishment. Uh, scripture says, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, 
and the rod of correction will drive it out. And I employed those techniques uh, while they were being raised, and uh, they're fine, young, upstanding men today. Yeah. Well, I <laughs> uh, my I have one son. He's 35 years old now, and uh, I remember one time I did get like a little paddle out and told him to bend over and I spanked him, gave him a, a couple of swats on the butt with it when he was a little boy. Um, I don't remember what he did or something, but I did that one time. And you know they say that. People say it's going to hurt me more than it hurts you, and I really experienced that. It really was hard for me to do it, and um, I don't. I think when you love your children, you hate to see them suffer in any way. Um, if anything, my biggest fear in life and my constant prayer is that uh, uh, my son will, you know, be safe and healthy and protected and not have problems. And so, uh, you don't want to. Uh, see your children, you know, suffer in any way. But I do think that the corporal punishment has its place in a young child that cannot understand or reason yet, as Brother Bill said, that uh, before you can sit them down and reason with them and they can understand it, and before that you can actually punish them in other ways, uh, taking away things from them and restricting them in some way, before that, at a younger age, that, that won't work because they, they don't have enough sense yet, enough knowledge. So, in that case, a, 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 a quick little slap on the hand or a little slap on the butt or something uh, will get their attention and uh, they learn that way. But I don't think it, it, it takes too long in, uh, in a person's growth before they reach a point where uh, I don't think that the physical corporal punishment would be uh, necessary. I think that it can be accomplished through other, through other means. Um, so uh, I don't know. Sparing the rod, yeah, I, I think that there. I see a lot of really spoiled children today where the parents don't discipline them at all. I mean, sometimes you'll go out in public and children are misbehaving so badly. And, I mean, you figure, what kind of a parent are they? They just let them run, run wild like little animals. Right. Okay, let's go to verse 25. The righteous eateth to the satisfying of soul, but the belly of the wicked shall want. Hmm. Well, I'm going to look at that in the Amplified, but let me get your reaction to that first. Go ahead. Well, yeah, it's, it, it, we know it's taught. I see it in, in spiritual terms. I suppose you could relate in, in, in physical, but I see it in spiritual terms. You know, the right it just eateth to the satisfying of his soul. So that their soul is satisfied in, in the righteousness, especially the righteousness and the goodness of God. So they're ever satisfied. But obviously, that the belly of the wicked should always be wanting, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, you could gain all the material wealth your heart's desire, you know, gold, money, food, and everything. But there's a wanting inside them, you know. There's the wanting for that 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 thing that really satisfies the soul, which is God. So I think, in spiritual terms, that that to me that that's resounding. Yeah, I don't. I'm not sure if it's uh, talking about food specifically, physically eating, uh, um, eating versus overeating, or if it's uh, can be in a broader sense, as you said. But either way, it does. You know, I think it certainly is a truth that we need to uh, adopt. But Eric, anything on that? Yes, uh, I believe that uh, is uh, extolling the law of recompense.
All right, uh, Brother Bill, could you uh, post up here uh, chapter 14 for us, or, or the first half of whatever you can fit up here? Yeah. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go to that in the Amplified, too, chapter 14. Oh, it's the first 15 verses on there anyway. Okay, good. Unfortunately, it starts right under verse, so verse 25 of the last uh, proverb, chapter 13, finishes at 1, and then straight under that, it's got every wise woman builder for house, which is which is the, the beginning of full end. Okay. All right, so we're on, we're on uh, um, verse 1 of chapter 14. <coughs> So the Proverbs is, uh, I've said this numerous times, but I've seen some people watch one video without watching the entire series, so I repeat myself sometimes. But uh, it's important to understand that um, the Bible is, is a history book. And you read other books in the Bible, apart from Proverbs and the book of Revelation, I think this applies to probably all the books, except for maybe the the Psalms, which are songs and poetry. But you take you know, Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, and all that, all that in the Old Testament, and even uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the epistles. These are historical accounts of, of people and events. And uh, they're cohesive, they're stories that flow. But Proverbs is not like that at all. It's a, it's a, it's a series of wise truths that are being expressed. And uh, so you cannot look at one chapter and think that this particular chapter is on a common theme. Within one chapter, you might have, you know, um, say there's 25 verses, you might have three or four or five or six different themes in that, and it will, and it will in one point, it start a new theme within a chapter. So uh, uh, there's just a lot of... Uh, gems or nuggets that you get from, from Proverbs. It's, it's a series of wise principles that, that we want to, want to try to adopt in our lives. Uh, so I don't know uh, if this is going to have any carry over to the last chapter at all, but it, the first verse of chapter 14 says, Every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. It seemed like a very broad, broad statement there. Um, what's your take on that? I think that's one of the ones you're just going to have to take it as it is. It's so obvious, isn't it? You know, a wise woman build of a house and a foolish one pull it down. You know, it could be, you know, I suppose you could say it's, it, you know, it could be regarding family life or situation or a wise woman or a wise mother. Would, would build their family up and, and, and you know, talk as in household, but a foolish one will, will tear down that, you know, the, the family and always be derogative. So you could, you know, put a slant there. Yeah, I, I think you've made the, the correct distinction there. It's not talking about building a house with bricks and lumber and stuff like that. It's talking about building up your household, building up your family. Or tearing it down through, let's say, verbal abuse and criticism, that kind of thing. Now, I have a mother that uh, never, except when I was a little boy and I got spankings all the time. <laughs> See, I told you, I spanked my boy once, but I got spankings from my mother, I say, like daily, all my whole childhood. You know, I got, my, my little sister would get a lot of glee. From saying, Mommy, Mommy, can I go get the big belt? <laughs> <laughs> she loved to, my sister loved to go get the belt from my mom, so my mom could spank me. Uh, or, she, or my mom would say, No, get a switch off the tree. So I, I got the switch off the switch, and I, or I got the belt. And my sister was the one that was always uh, there, really anxious to go get it from my mom. <laughs> um, 
But uh, so I, I got spankings when I was a little boy, you know, for being, you know, being bad. But <laughs> but uh, my, I remember my mother as just being absolutely loving. And apart from those when I was a child being getting spankings, which I probably deserved. But uh, my mother was a complete encourager, nothing but encouragement and praise. For example, you've never heard me sing. You never will hear me sing because I am completely tone deaf and I can't hit a note and I'm just horrible. When I was in the seventh grade, they let you join art or chorus. And I love to sing, so I joined chorus. But after a month, I was the only one that was still told I had to transfer to art because I couldn't sing. Uh, I remember I was at a home church years ago, and the pastor asked me if I wouldn't sing. And so I said, okay. I started clapping. and said, you're trying to clap. And he asked me not to clap either because I can't even clap correctly. Uh, so it looks like you've got the same gift as me. You, you're absolutely tone deaf when it comes to singing and clapping. And I'm useless on you all. Yeah. I usually mumble, you know, if there's, if there's in church and that, like they're singing some real, where you have to kind of hit the note hymns and songs, that, you know, you generally have a monotone mumble in the back, because, you know, otherwise I'll spoil it. <laughs> well, the reason I'm even talking about my <clears throat> no talent for singing is the fact that my mother would always praise my singing. My, my, my mother would say, you're, you're great. She never would criticize it. Nothing but positive praise for me and, and the rest of the, the kids. She was an absolute encourager and positive. She wasn't critical or, or, or negative in any, in any way. So she was building us up, uh, not tearing us down. So I, I can certainly identify with that verse there. Uh, Brother Eric, what's your experience with that? Well, I love this verse. Uh, it's a uh, very powerful verse. Uh, if if the women of uh, our land are uh, wise, then uh, we will have a strong land. But if our women are foolish, then uh, our whole land uh, won't stand. So it's very important that uh, we get somebody out there to evangelize the young women so that there'll be wise women that know the Lord. Okay. Please be sure that up. I think I'll just uh, add credence to what Eric has just said there because you do see a modern trend in society and, and I'll per adventure it's deliberate and it's from Satan that, that to diminish the role of, of a housekeeper of a mother of someone who tends to the family you know to, to diminish that role and make them feel bad for that so they have to go out and work and earn money which is destroying the family you know it, it's utterly destroying the family and you wonder why there's fragmentation within you know especially western societies is because of that and it's employed by the devil to to, to destroy the office of a good woman and a good mother and replace it with, you know, trinkets, you know, prideful trinkets. Oh, you're a go-getter, you're a woman, you go and earn your own money, you this, that. But these things, in the grand scale of things, are, are counted as nothing to, to a good wife and a good mother and a good housekeeper. And like I said, I think it's a, the devil's ploy, and, and I think, you know, Brother Eric just spoke volumes on that, just in that. Yeah, I, I, I think that there is no greater profession than being a mother and a wife. Um, and it, it, it has been diminished by this uh, over the last you know, 20, 30, 40 years or so that there's been this women's movement that uh, uh, dis, um, disrespect the 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 woman that wants to stay at home and just be a mother and a wife and they, they act like that is not an accomplishment there's nothing and they also think that 
it's equally it's equally beneficial for the woman to work and the man to stay at home. Like they're interchangeable parts. But I was amazed that maybe a couple of decades ago, Time Magazine had on its cover a, a statement that was like a great revelation that they had, and it said, "Men and women are different." <laughs> Like, oh, here's the news. We've discovered men and women are different. <laughs> they, uh, but they, they're trying to make it uh, us interchangeable. But men are different sizes, different strengths, uh, and different chemi chemistry going on, different ways our brains work. And uh, it's that's even science has ex accepted and proven that. And God has made us differently. He made us anatomically different so that we can fit together. He made us mentally and chemically different so that we have uh, logic, reason, emotions, compassion, all this mixture that complement each other rather than uh, making, them ident making us identical and then there's no complementary. Complementarianism. Yeah. Um, well, like some, a minister years ago said to me, talking about if this subject comes up quite a lot in, in England because that you know to and fro and over the debate of women elders and bishops and everything else and, and he just made the comment a sensible you know quote and he, and he says that men and women are equally different so that there's, there's, there's total equality with man and woman in God's eyes but as you just said we're different there's no way on this earth that I could be a housekeeper and a mother like my wife couldn't do it. It's not in my makeup. It's not in my genes. It's not in any any for me. And and the, the the same applies for the wife. You know, the, the wife couldn't be something to do the, the the heavy lifting around in the garden and the digging and growing the vegetables and all this sort of stuff. So yeah, we're both equal in the eyes of God, but we, we are totally different. And as you say, we complement each other. So yeah, and and again, get back to the the whole point. I don't you know I think there's no greater charge given to a woman that then to be a homemaker and, and that, that's an honor you know I believe for a woman uh, here in America I'm assuming it's probably the same in England but uh, you're right that people have been for a long time now they've been choosing to uh, uh, leave the children at home as soon as possible and the woman go out and work so that they can have extra material things, uh, and then the child, children, whether they want to, the parents want to recognize or not, the children are neglected in in a, way, in a way, and we have a term here called latchkey children, where they're just home alone, and maybe with a group of their, several siblings, they're alone. They're thinking that well, they're old enough they can be alone, and, or even with a a surrogate, some kind of a babysitter or a nanny or something, but it's not the same. And the, the women want to go out and have their careers, and uh, maybe, maybe they, they, they certainly have not uh, valued the the role of being mothers and wives, and think that going off into some profession is much more satisfying to them, much more fulfilling, whereas. The most fulfilling thing, the most honorable thing of all, would be to stay home and take care of those children. And uh, I think the children are damaged without that. And uh, it's, it's, it's a, it, to me, it's a shameful thing I've seen. Just like so many things in our society that have changed. You know, we call them traditional values. The traditional values that we had in the uh, last century, you know, up to the 1950s, probably around in the 60s is when things started changing with the sexual revolution and the women's, women's movement. And, uh, those things have changed things so much for the worst. Let's go to verse 2. Uh, he, he that walketh in his uprightness feareth the Lord. But he that is perverse in his ways despises him. Now, at first reading, a person might think that if you're walking uprightly, if you're doing the right things, um, that you, you, 
you're fearing the Lord because you're going to be punished for doing good. But it's, it's not really what that means at all, is it? No, again, that, that is a classic example where the word fear it, it, it is reverence, it's honor, it's respect, it's love, it's gratitude. It encompasses all, all, all the good elements of fear. I know it sounds like an oxymoron, but, but it's not. It's because the English language, we've got one word, fear. Whereas in older languages, the Greek and, and the Hebrew, it has different connotations. You can, you can fear in gratitude, love and reverence, but you can also fear in trembling you know, and terror. But this is certainly not a trembling and terror. This is a reverent kind of fear for God. And you're muted. Every time I talk to him, I'm muted. And he's saying, if I'm muted, I get a good laugh out of that every time. <laughs> okay, verse, uh, uh, the second half says, but he that is perverse in his ways despises him, despises the Lord. Um, Brother, Brother Eric, what do you think of that verse, verse 2? Well, uh, the second part uh, is very puzzling. Uh, I can imagine uh, somebody despising the Lord, okay? Uh, they're going to be in big trouble. Okay, I'm going to read it in the, uh, the Amplified. Uh, he who walks in uprightness reverently and worshipfully fears the Lord, but he who is contrary and devious in his ways despises him. Okay, Brother Bill? Yeah, yeah. I just agree with what, what you just said there. You know, you obviously, you despise God. You know, if you know, if you don't, if you haven't got reverence and worship towards God, and and you prefer, you know, perversion and deviance, then, then you're despising God. You know, despising his, his love and kindness towards you, and his and his, you know, wisdom that he, that he's got in, in your life. So yeah, yeah, it just says what it is. Well. Let's, okay, um, walk in uprightness. Okay, let's just say that you're doing the right things, and uh, then perverse in the ways. Let's say you're doing bad things. Uh, do do either of you do do you ever experience shame when you realize you're doing something uh, that uh, is perverse or wrong, and and because this verse says, if you love the Lord, you, you shouldn't be doing those things. If you despise the Lord, then you don't care. You don't care about your behavior because you couldn't care less about what the Lord thinks of it. Yeah, yeah, because it's deeper than what initially seems. Because, you know, we're all sinners, we all do wrong. And we're all perverse and crooked in our ways, all right? But there are many who are still, you know, perverse in our ways and still sinners, because we are all sinners, yet love the Lord. So this is deeper, I think. I think this is willful want and not, not desiring at all God. Not, you know, not only just despising God's wisdom and his love and his mercy, but despising God, you know, entirely. You know, and I think that that's what is trying to be expressed there. Because otherwise, you know, that means every single human being on earth despises God. Because we're all sinners and we all, you know, walk in our own, our own ways. So that's why I believe it has to be on a, a deeper level. You know, the first person is someone who, yeah, they're, they're a sinner. You know, they err, but they, 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 they love God. And so they're upright in that sense. But the second person in that portion, 
you know, doesn't want to entertain God to do, doesn't care whatsoever, and actually disposes him. That's that's what I say. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, I do think, in my from my own experience, that uh, um, from time to time I get really ashamed of myself, and it's it's because I it's just like uh, my said my son said to me. Uh, Recently, we had a conversation. He said, "Dad, you never, you never beat me or abused me or in any way. The only thing I've ever wanted in, in my life was was for you to be proud of me." And uh, of course, I told him how proud I am of him. And I am truly very proud of him. And, but uh, I feel the same way in our relationship with the Lord is that. You know, I do want to be proud of me. I mean, I know he loves me in spite of my flaws. But I can't, when I catch myself doing something and I feel ashamed, I, I feel, I, I do want the Lord to be proud of me. I don't know if I'm like, overreacting or what do you think of that? Well, yeah, there is an element there that, that, that comes into that portion. You know, there's, the, the word says there's none righteous, no, not one. So we're not talking about someone who, who's, you know, upright and righteous, walking in all of God's commands, and they're perfect, because that's impossible. So it, it must to do with a heart and conscience matter. You know, so you and obviously I and Eric and, and, and all the other saints would fit into the top character, you know, because, yeah, we all walk unrighteously, but, you know, we know it. You know, the Lord... You know, dwells in us and, and 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 does certainly let us know when we're misbehaving, or or we're going our own little way and in our own little words. So, in that sense, we're we're walking upright because we're walking with God. But you know, and and the the, the other person hasn't got a conscience in that sense. You know, they, they don't even care to, to to you know whether they walk in her or not. They have no conscience at all. You know what I'm saying? You have a conscience. You do wrong. You feel bad about it because you you know you're displeasing the Lord, as do I, and as does Eric, and as do every saint. You know we might continue to do it, but it's not a happy place. You know we don't we we, we want to please our Father, and the Father delights in us. So you know we want to be upright, but the other person doesn't care about their Father, and, and doesn't desire at all to please him or be pleased. Yeah, that's how I always say it. All right, so I'll go on to verse 3. In the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride, but the lips of the wise shall preserve them. I, I think this is talking about the things that come out of our mouth. It makes me think what Jesus said is that it's not what goes into your mouth that is uh, um, the problem. It's, it's what's coming out of your mouth. <laughs> and uh, this is what it says, in the mouth of the foolish. And I think it's talking about the, the prideful things that people say, the bad things that come out of the mouth. But the lips of the wise shall preserve them. Uh, when the wise we're going to be prudent. We're going to, um, like Brother Bill, you, you just earlier said you wanted to think about something. That was wise. That was prudent. You held your lips. You held your tongue because you didn't feel you had uh, enough, uh, enough uh, of an opinion on it to say anything, so you, you didn't say anything. And there's many verses in Proverbs that talks about people that just want to talk foolishly, and, and their foolishness is just revealed because the more they talk, the more people recognize how foolish they are. And it says if you're wise, you just keep your mouth shut, and then maybe people people think you're 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 wise because you're you're not talking so much. <laughs> Yeah, I'm generally going to say I agree with you on that one. Can you go to verse 4? It says, 
where no oxen are, the crib is clean. But much increase is by the strength of the ox. Okay, you guys have to explain this one to me. I have no idea. <laughs> I understand the first part, where no oxen are, the crib is clean, because obviously oxen, they make a mess. Uh, so the crib, the area, the bedding area is clean. And if you want to spiritualize that, you know, you could say the crib is our, you know, our, our temple, your know, whole body, and the oxen is all the stuff that defiles it. So you could do that. But the second part, I can't actually understand whatsoever. I really can't. So we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to lean on the wisdom of Eric there. Come on, Eric, <laughs> give us the answer to that. Okay, but you guys are gonna regret it. Now, this is one of those X-rated verses. It's talking about the waste. The stronger the ox, the more he's going to go to the bathroom. Well, it sounds more and more legitimate than what I, I can think of anyway, so there might be truth in that. All right, let's look at this in the Amplified, see if it's helpful. Uh, where no oxen are, the grain crib is empty, but much increase of crops comes by the strength of the ox. Now that, that makes perfect sense, but does that what that verse means? You know, where no oxen are, the grain crib is empty. There's no reason to, to feed them, right, if there's no oxen, right? But much increase of crops comes by the strength of the ox. So if you have strong oxen, they're going to accomplish more, and you're going to have more crops. Uh, that's, that's, I mean, that's easy to understand, and there's no argument with it. But I don't, I'm not sure if that's what that verse means, because I don't understand what that verse means. Yeah, I don't know. What other translations do you got? What's that? What other translations do you got? Okay. I want to get this one pinned down because both completely contradictory to each other. So okay, okay. fourteen point four. Let me see. A lot of the translations will look at here. Okay, let's look at um, uh, uh, Let's look at the English Standard. It's something that's popular in England, isn't it? Where there are no oxen, the manger is clean, but abundant crops come by the strength of the ox. Okay, that seems to agree with the Amplified. And let's look at the uh, Geneva. I want to see what that says. Where no oxen are, there the crib is empty, but much increase come up by the strength of the ox. We'll try what should we try that uh, the hated version that so many people hate the new no, no, so the thingy makes a bit more sense. What's that? The the, the on, it's the Young's literal translation makes more sense and aligns itself closer to the, the, the King James, okay. it says, without oxen, a stall is clean. All right? And great is the increase by the power of the ox. Mm -hmm. So that, that more ties in uh, you know, the King James. And, and the new map standard says, where no oxen are, the manger is clean. But much increase comes by the strength of the ox. So yeah, again, I'll get the first part. The first part of most of these different translations I'm looking on here agree with the King James, you know, how I try to explain it, that it's clean because there's no, obviously, no doo-doos and no mess around. So you've got a clean manger, a clean crib. But this, the second part, again, is where I'm stuck at. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. At least I'm not muted this time. 
Uh, all right, well, we pretty much exhausted that, and I think that these other translations are, are pretty much in agreement, and the KJV is the only one that is uh, confusing to, to me, at least. All right, so let's go to uh, verse 5. Uh, a faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. Okay, <laughs> as I was saying, a liar, a liar lies. A non liar doesn't lie. Yeah. And there's nothing to really say about that, is there? Not that's, that's exactly straightforward, that one. Yeah. If, if they were all that straightforward, there's no reason for us to even have a discussion. <laughs> Verse 6, a scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not, but knowledge is easy unto him that understandeth. Well, of course knowledge would be easy to someone who understands, but a scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not. What is a scorner? A scorner is someone who makes fun and mock on it. Mm -hmm. You know, someone who's just, you know, mocking, you know, and, and wants to find true, good and wholesome wisdom, ain't going to find it, are they? Because they're, 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 they're not in the right mind. Because obviously true, wholesome wisdom isn't a scorner or a mocker. So, you know, the common sense, that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, verse 6, a scorner, oh, I just read that. Verse 7, uh, go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. You don't hang around with fools. Because once you establish someone's a fool, you should be hanging around with them. I do think the exception is uh, even if a fool, you know what? Once we establish someone's a fool, it's like establishing that someone is, a, uh, you know, a swine. As Jesus said, "Don't cast your pearls to the swine." Um, if they don't have ears to hear, they're being foolish. Then, okay, once we recognize that, then we should just part company. But uh, until we learn that they're fools, or or we learn that they're swine, in that sense, uh, then I think we should attempt to, you know. Tell them the good news. Yeah, and I, and I think even that verse backs it up. So it says, Go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceiveth not in him the lips of knowledge. So at the point when you realize that he is swine and your pearls are not going to make any, any kind of indent, then, then you kind of, yeah, leave him. Right, fair enough, boy. Shake the dust off your feet. But you've yeah. still got to be around that fall until you get to the point where you perceive he's not interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let me make a note that to uh, pick this up here on the next time, uh, verse uh, 14, verse 8 is where we'll pick it up. I want to have, have enough time left so that we can do the invitation for salvation. Because, uh, yeah, we have like 10 minutes left. Uh, Okay, first, before we go into that, let me just ask each of you to just make any broad commentary on anything that might have stood out to you today. As a broad stroke, I would say there's been a lot of easy, <laughs> easy verses to understand and, and a lot of verses we don't actually understand whatsoever. But that's, that's the beauty of a fellowship reading together and working things out, being good brains. So that, that's the whole point of that. So if God didn't chuck in the odd verse that was hard, you know, we wouldn't use our brains, we wouldn't be out of fellowship, and, and it'd be all too easy. So, you know, God and his humour and his wisdom and, and, and mercy chucks in these verses like, like he did earlier to, to, to make us think about things. And, and there is a couple of verses I picked on today that I really haven't, and I'm honest, I'm being really honest, I haven't got a clue. So I'm going to have to take that to the Lord and say, look, can you explain this because I ain't got a clue? You know, and then, so that's, that, that would be my take, you know, other than that the, the predominantly all, all these proverbs are for our benefit and for our learning and for our well-being. 
Yeah, amen. Uh, Brother Eric, what's, what stood out to you today, if anything? Well, being uh, we started on verse 13, and we started at 2.13, on chapter 13, uh, I'm just glad we made it through. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, remind me, Brother Bill, because we closed the live broadcast, remind me to tell you my idea for what, what I want to do after we finish Proverbs. Okay? I, I don't want to announce it right now, but publicly. But uh, I think that uh, I will ex expand on what uh, you said, Brother Bill, about uh, uh, admitting that sometimes we're stopped. Um, I, I've said this before when I've tried to uh, kind of like argue against the people who I can deem as, as just um, egotistical. That they, they think that they can't be wrong and they know it all. And uh, I, I say there's not one person, not one person alive in the world today that understands every word and every verse in the entire Bible. And if they think that they've got to completely figure it out 100%, then they're, they're full of pride. And, and uh, so many times we come to uh, portions of the scriptures that befuddle us. And sometimes years later, all of a sudden we see the light and we have an epiphany from God and there's a revelation and we, we, we get it. Sometimes it comes directly from the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it comes from a brother or, or a sister that you know, is able to explain it in a way that I never saw it before. And so um, most of it though is pretty straightforward and uh, a lot, even when it's straightforward there are a lot of a lot of things can be gleaned from it beyond it's just the simple statements. Um, that's why we comment and expound upon these things. Uh, but um, this is not the first time or the last time that we're going to come across some verses that, that kind of stop us. Um, let me, let's go now to the, the main reason we are even on the internet and that uh, the whole purpose of our ministries. Um, I would ask Brother Bill first, um, how about the person that's watching now and either um, doesn't understand uh, the message of salvation at all or misunderstands it and thinks it's something that it is not? Let's make, let's make sure before we close today that people understand what they must do so that they get to go to heaven, for, away from heaven forever. Uh, and and the, the common error, the biggest common error that people are holding today, let's correct that. Yeah, well, my first bit of advice would be, uh, it means we're talking about Proverbs, which is wisdom, is, is that people would just humble themselves and, and become wise under salvation. You know that that takes wisdom. You, you have to use you have to use wisdom to be saved in that sense. Wisdom isn't intellect. You don't have to be highly intellectual to be saved. You've just got to have your head screwed on and and see things what they really are. And, and in doing that, you know every creature out there. I believe every creature out there knows there's something missing. They know the things they do they shouldn't do. You know, and, and they know for some reason that they're never going to be everything in that sense. That they're lacking. And, and basically, we, we call that sin. You're falling short. Okay, so you're never going to attain to a level where you're fully satisfied. You're never going to attain to a level where you're going to be good enough to please God. And that's why I believe God deliberately, and, and, and you know, people can lie. You know, they can say, oh, I don't believe in God. But there's always a niggling in the back of the mind, I believe, in every creature, and especially a, a, a God-shaped hole in their heart. 
because God is ever crying out to people to be saved. And I believe that the, that the soul of, of every creature is crying out to be reconciled to God. You know, some people deny it, some people suppress it, but it's there. But, but you know, the short and the curlies of it is, is, is every single one of us has sinned to come short of the glory of God. You know, and sin, as, as we know, you know, especially, you know, me, Luke and Eric, and, and, and if you're a non-believer watching now and you're not sure what it means, it just means to miss the mark. To get to heaven, you, you've got to get to there, okay? And on our best day, we get to there. It's impossible. We cannot get to heaven by ourselves. All right? But the good news is that, that, that there was a person, all right? it was actually God, and his name is Jesus Christ. He came to earth, and he came down for, for one reason alone, and that is to die that we may live, to, to, to bridge this gap between man and God. And how he'd done this was, was he became, the word even says he became sin for us. All right. That that is not saying that he was a sinner. That is saying that he came to earth and he bore the sins of the whole world on his body at Calvary. So he took away all your sins. You know that every single creature's day, the sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west. That's how far that, that, that God has removed this sin issue. So today it's a sun issue. All right. So you, your sins are paid for. Christ has made full payment at Calvary, but you need to accept. This pain that is made for you, you know, and and by doing that, you, you you just have to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ this day, you know. He's, he's offered you the best gift in the world today. He's made a payment for your sins. He's there and waiting, knocking at the door, you know, as it says. And you could you could describe it as knocking on the door of your heart, that 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 God-shaped hole you have within your heart. Christ is there knocking, wanting to come in, but you need to you need to receive him unto yourself. You know, if I like to put it in terms of, because I like food, I like to put it in terms of food. If I have served you up, say you're really hungry, and I've served you up the best three course meal that you could ever imagine, every food and every delight that you want, and I offer you this freely, say, look, this is yours because I love you. I don't have to give you this, but I choose to give you this free meal, okay? And you reject it. That is absolute madness. And that is what is going on. Christ is offering us this best meal, this best gift that you could ever receive, and that's called salvation this day. But you have to receive it unto yourself. So you have to get to the place, we've already got to the place where you realise you're a sinner and fallen short, and you've got to the place where you realise there's a God-shaped hole in your heart. You need to get to the place now where you accept this free gift that Christ is offering you today. It's really that simple. We don't need to go into theological terms or, or in a real great detail about the atonement, the propitiation. That comes later on. But if you want to get saved this day, you want this God-shaped hole that is missing in your heart today, accept Christ as Saviour, accept the fact that he died for all your sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and most importantly, that he rose again the third day victorious in resurrection power. This is important because... If Christ didn't rise from the dead, neither shall any creature. And But he did rise from the dead. So if you believe on him and in those facts, the same resurrection power was in Christ that day will reside in you forever. And come the day when you die, because we're all going to die, everyone's going to die, you will have the confidence and known within your heart and the fact that the word actually says so, that you will be raised from the dead. What, what a glorious gift that this Christ is offering today. And it's totally free. You can't buy it, you can't earn it, and you can certainly not work for it. The scripture says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man for boast. So this is a free gift that Christ is offering you this day. And I just implore you and ask you, just in humility and in simplicity, just believe that Jesus did die for you personally. That he was died, you know, buried for you, and that he did rise just for you. Believe on those simple, clear facts, and you will receive the free gift of everlasting life, and you will, by guarantee, go to heaven. That's the best news in the world, and it's the, really, to be honest, as simple as I can put it. But you know, pray, receive that, just as a small child, and 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 you know, all is good from then. You become not only a son of God, and you're going to go to heaven. 
you're going to be my brother or sister. Now, you might not like that, but nonetheless, you know, I'd like that. And God will, you know, like that. And even the angels in heaven will rejoice in that fact. So pray, accept Christ this day. God bless them. And that is the, that's the gospel. Well, I say amen to that. That is the true gospel. The, the, the gospel just is a Greek word. It means good news. And uh, there was nothing that Brother Bill just said there that should distress you, should make you feel burdened. Or make you feel like, oh, I, I, I don't know if this is going to work because I, I, I'm not, I don't know if I can reach to heaven. And no, this is good news because it's not based upon what you do. It's based upon what Jesus did. Uh, so, just as Brother Bill says, it's as simple as putting your faith completely on Jesus. And uh, if you understand that, then. You should be like celebrating right now. It should be the best news you've ever heard. Uh, no longer believe in your own ability to work your way to heaven. Reject that and just believe that Jesus will get you there because he promised it to you. All right. Uh, I'm going to give uh, the final word here to Brother Eric. What do, you, do you want to say anything before we close? Uh, thank you for having me on here. And... Uh... Please uh, hear these wise words uh, that uh, have been brought to you this day uh, by God's grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ fill your soul with his love and redemption through Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 And this grace that Brother Eric mentioned is that's the, the kindness and love that God has for us that we don't deserve. That's grace. All right. Um, join, join us uh, every Wednesday and Sunday at 1 p.m. Pacific time for another live broadcast. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.